All right, everybody, welcome to Inference Swap at InferenceSwap.com, hosted, hosted by Barney's Hub Bootery, 1198 North Main Street. We are so excited about being in Season 3 with your host, not just John, but... And Chris. And Chris. We're here, man. Chris is here. I'm here. We're here. And this year, we are starting off with The Mystery of Christ. We're going to get right into this Robert Capon book. Uh, we're so excited to be with you. I hope everybody's doing great. And we're going to ju- start jumping into the uh, to the mystery of Christ. Chris, what do you got to say about that? <laughs> yeah, so Robert Capon never disappoints. Never, for <laughs> lack of words, he will... Uh, he will send you back, uh, making you reevaluate everything that you know. And sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. But <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a good thing. I mean, the point of this podcast is always to break down inferences and presuppositions we might bring to our own faith and to others. And the reason we do that is because we are heavy into believing discipleship matters. In a time where we're being told how to think, what to believe, uh, who to love, how to love, all those different kinds of things. I mean, we need to know what we believe and what we're actually proclaiming to the world. And maybe some of our beliefs are holding back um, our proclamation, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think that's definitely true. There's, And that's what the wonderful thing that Robert Cabin can bring to us is he, he's definitely very provocative. He's going to, you know, it's going to be heavy. It's going to hit hard, but... You know, the good thing with it is always drives us back to uh, look, you know, look and see what we believe and see if it actually holds muster, if it's something that we need to reevaluate and maybe even change. Yeah. So let's sort of I know we talked about this a little bit last week, Chris. Why don't you share? Well, let's just start jumping in. We're in chapter one. Mm -hmm. The name of the chapter is called Helen. Right. And I think uh, tell let's tell the people once again how this chapters are set up. Yeah. So. Uh, each odd chapter, so one, three, five, and onward, uh, is going to be a person's name, and it's going to be someone that he's counseling. It could be someone that he actually meets with, or it could be someone he just runs into an encounter after one of his sermons. And then the even chapters, two, four, and for you know, and on, are going to be uh, his maybe teasing out a little bit more mm-hmm. of because what he does in these interviews is they're very short, and it's just a kind of a brief discussion. But the even chapters are what he's going to say is, okay, now it's time for us to talk. What do you not, you know, and he's going to start going through, what is the pushback you have against me? Yeah, and he's got some characters in there that are given different pushback that are going to show themselves as we get further into this book. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason we wanted to do this is because it's called The Mystery of Christ. And um, last week we sort of asked the question, like, what is a pastor's role or a Mm -hmm. priest's role or... You know, in my case or your case, a missionary or somebody who's uh, discipling. What is our role? What are they expecting from us? And and those kind of things. Have you had a chance to think about a little bit of that? What do you, what do you think? Because that's going to come out in this chapter. Yeah, yeah, on. yeah, definitely. And so, you know, what Capon certainly is going to argue is that the first primary, secondary, on and on role of the pastor is first and foremost is to be in what he calls an apostolic witness to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. They are essentially, in a nutshell, someone who proclaims who Jesus is. That's right. And they proclaim that gospel. Well, how do you think about it? What do you think? What do you think about that? You think <laughs> that's, think that's, that's the primary? <laughs> do you think that's the primary role of a pastor? I mean, uh, I, I think that's certainly the idealized in a, in a lot of people. I think that's why uh, anyone who goes into pastoral ministry for the most part that's their first and foremost motivation is to proclaim this wonderful news of who jesus is i just think in a lot of the models that we see in our current culture which is you know america that it becomes more of a business model of hierarchy ceo and all those other things and they become more of a business administrator i think yeah and i think when you start to deal with people as we're going to start dealing with helen in this first chapter um, it's easy to outsource those problems as a pastor, like especially if you're in a big staff, big church. You can go well, just go over there to that that pastor. That pastor is going to be the helping pastor, right. or the yeah. or the, the what do they call it? The secondary. I forgot the name of that. But the uh, vice pastor, pastor, associate. I'm the associate to the associate to the associate <laughs> pastor. Yeah, it's easy to do that, and they could, that could be their role in the church. And mm-hmm. 
Um, most people think that the pastor has some kind of special anointing. They just want the pastor, mm -hmm. you know, and really what we have is the Holy Spirit. But anyway, we won't, we'll get into all that, right? So I'll just sort of start this off. So this lady, his chapter one, now remember the book is called The Mystery of Christ, is about this lady named Helen. And uh, he sees her at this party, uh, and she basically wants to meet with him, and he, he agrees to it, uh, not knowing what he's going to get into, right? And when she comes into the office, the first story she tells him is he sort of asking, how you doing? And she's like, it's, it's much better because my daughter had a major accident. Was it a skiing accident, I think? Right. And she had some brain damage or whatever it was, and they didn't know what if she was going to live, her and her husband. And... Uh, so she makes a deal with God. Do you remember what that deal was? Right. Um, yeah, so that's how she begins her discussion with him as she says, yeah, my, my daughter is in the skiing accident. Me and my husband fly up and meet her and just make sure everything's okay. They doesn't seem like things are going to go well, but thankfully she does recover well. Uh, but she kind of turns, you know, and, you know, kind of gets into the next thing and says, well, that's not exactly what I'm here to talk about. And she kind of breaks, you know, the elephant in the room, which is I have been committing adultery for the last few years or whatever. I don't remember how long, but, you know, and yeah. she says, I made a deal with God. I made a vow that if my daughter were to come out okay from this, that I would break off, you know, that adultery. Yeah. And, so, and she, she says, I suppose what I'm here for is to ask whether now – that she's better if I really have to do something about that promise. Mm -hmm. Do I have to make good on it? And so that's how this session begins. Now, let me ask you, Chris. <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot, bro. And it, this would be tough, right? Right. Because what Capon doesn't do is give her what she wants. Right. Right. In this counseling session. She wants an answer. She wants to know what she should do. Does yeah. she have to do this? And do you like? And I think it's really cool how he he's a very good listener. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's li listening to what she's saying and responding to what she's listening, knowing what she really wants. And what she wants is for him to make that to either reinforce that she should or shouldn't, or to give him or her a direct answer. Now, probably I would have said, "You need to cut that out." <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, what would you have said? Yeah, to be honest, I have zero counseling experience. Yeah. <laughs> and so I just am not tuned to definitely listen to that type of stuff. But yeah, I, I would say most likely that my ears would perk up as soon as she said that. And that's where my brain would focus on. And I would probably miss a lot of the other stuff she's saying. And I would want to get, like you said, straight to the heart of the matter, so to speak, and say, what you're doing is wrong. It's going to destroy your family, all these different things. Which he, he labels as the easiest form of counseling, which that surprised me. Yeah. He's like the the easiest thing you could have done, the, the simplest without thinking is say that. Yeah. And, and this is where it gets into this idea of what is the pastor's role. And he's like, I'm not a psychologist. So my first response is not i'm a pastor I, my, my first responsibility is to give you the good news of the gospel so he refuses to tell her anything what she should or should not do do you find that like amazing i that, that's that's pretty how does that make you feel as a, a listener you know what i mean like right um initially I, I'm just like Helen I'm completely thrown off where she says what well, you know because he his first question to her is well what what do you want to do Helen <laughs> what do you want to do about no, he it? said he literally says you've assumed that because you made a promise to God you have to keep it right right <laughs> like on what basis are you do you think that's true right. now think about that question like you made a promise to God. Why yeah. do you think that it's necessary for you to I, keep that I, I, promise? I, I know I've made my promises <laughs> to God. <laughs> There's this great movie with uh, Burt Reynolds, old movie. You know, you know who Burt Reynolds is? You're a little younger than I am. I, I, I don't know. 
He's a big hat, funny guy, right? No, <laughs> no. Burt <laughs> Reynolds. Oh God, that just showed my age. Well, for you older folk that know who Burt Reynolds, he was he was like the number one actor yeah. in the seventies and the eighties. Smokey and the Bandit. Yeah, maybe you know. He's the longest yard too, right? Okay, so you do know who he yeah, is. Okay, you're just making me feel yeah, old, you jerk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has this movie where him and Dom DeLuise, are, he, they escape from his mental institution. And at the end of the movie, I think that's the movie, and he gets dropped into the ocean. And he looks, and he can barely see the, the beach. I mean, barely. And he's like, dear God, if, I can, if you help me get to the beach... I will give up all my possessions mm, yeah. and I will give up everything I am and serve you with all my heart for the rest of my life. And he starts swimming and he starts swimming and then he, he look, he stops, he gets tired, he looks out there and he's like, I think I can make that, God. I want to thank you for giving me the strength. And I promise <laughs> if I make it through there, I'll give you half of my possessions <laughs> and I'll serve you the best I can. <laughs> and he starts swimming and he starts swimming and he realizes like he's he can literally almost get past like the sandbank where he can walk into the beach right. and he stops again and he goes dear god i want to th- thank you for giving me the strength to get here i'm going to try really hard to serve you but i can't give you my money cuz i need it <laughs> and he goes <laughs> and i think it's sort of like that we make these promises to god and he asks a legitimate questions on what basis do you think that these things are true and and yeah. you want to you want to elaborate on that or do you want me to keep going uh, go, go ahead, go ahead. No, I think, I think he, he's right. Like, what God are you believing in? Because at the end of the day, doesn't Jesus say, let your yes be yes and your no be no? Keep, keep this whole thing simple mm-hmm. and relational. Don't make a bunch of promises that you know you're not. And I know he's right. God, for, for God's sake. Like, he knows you're not going to. And so he's like, what God are you believing in? It's like, uh, this isn't the God of the Bible that, that makes deals. This isn't a transactional relationship. Yeah? Right. And I think that says a lot about his knowledge of the gospel, but what does it say about us, you know? <laughs> what? No, yeah, no, it's, I'm just, I have no idea what I would do in that situation too if I'm just swimming in the, in the ocean. <laughs> I think there were definitely, yeah, who knows, but I would say certainly in, my, you know, earlier days of being a Christian, I, I think I've made plenty of vows about doing stuff. And what you find is that it's just 100% of the time. Well, what does that it. say? What does that say about our Christianity if we're making deals with God? Uh, then it, we're trying, you know, we're trying to put power over God. We're trying to put him in a, our corner that if we, if we meet up on our, you know, meet good on our end, he's got to meet good on his end of whatever parameter we set on him that if we say god so if what does I that tell us about like what we believe i mean we really don't believe the gospel is that gospel no no of course not yeah because you are you're trying to wield god to do something for you when the gospel says over and over again that it's not about us trying to control him it's about us dying to ourselves so he can live in us yeah and it's not like so let's say you do keep your promise what are you expecting and then, and why should you expect whatever you're expecting? And then the right. other side of it is, well, what if I don't? Does that mean I'm damned? So are you damned with the, the yes by keeping it or damned with the no by not keeping it? And the reality is that's not the gospel, right? That's what I think he's trying to get. He's like, what God are you believing in? So what I'm getting out of this, and you argue with me if you want to, is what we believe about God, those people, presumptions that we we bring to God really affects our actions and and what we will do the kind of relationship we will have and if we don't believe in the God of the gospel then then why not wheel and deal because at least you then have a chance right this isn't like out of the odyssey odyssey like these gods are making deals they're doing all these Sure. things and uh, you know Odysseus is trying to mm-hmm. make it through all these things and outsmart the gods and all this kind of stuff and, and this isn't that you know what I'm saying and I, I think acceptance according to the Bible Bible is a, a free gift it's it's bestowed on the world of people that are deal makers and deal breakers you know what I'm saying I think for some reason 
I mean, I think he says it right up front. He he has to, he wants you to know that. Why why do you think that that's adamant or a necessity for her to know? Or do you disagree with me? No, no, I I, I definitely do agree with you. I think it's very important that she that she knows that up front so that she, you know, it's almost like he's, you know, trying to figure out what God does she believe in first and foremost, and then to put a mirror in front of her of who that God is and show how it's deficient and just show how oh, ultimately just be crippling and corrupting. And, and her life is a result of what she believes. Isn't that interesting? Right, right. I think we miss that part. I call that root to fruit, like whatever you believe in the root of your heart shows the, in the fruit of your life <clears throat> and, and I think it's interesting that there's probably a lot of belief and unbelief in all of us and we know where it produces what fruit fruit it produces you know and in this case she's made a deal with God right and then asking him he's asking then asking the pastor about adultery what should I do <laughs> <laughs> you get what I mean how what is that, you know? Right, yeah. And this and this is where, you know, in terms of from just a purely pastoral counseling, you know, that Capon is just so spot on and so good that he, you know, he doesn't answer that question. And she keeps getting, in, you know, infuriated with him over and over about what, why won't you deal with this? And, it, and he, well, first thing he says is, well, you already know what you're going to do. You're looking for either an affirmation from me to say break it off and then you're gonna or i'm gonna tell you no don't break it off and you're gonna say well i'm not gonna listen to you anyway and so he already you know he's just trying to present to her that you already know what you're going to do my role is not necessarily to you know pull you away and to prevent you from doing the action that you're already going to do it's going to be well whatever you end up deciding to do whether that be good bad wrong or whatever I'm still going to be here with you, and we're still going to work with it together. Right. And, I mean, do you, do you think, what, what I guess I kept asking myself, because he goes into, like, the truth of the gospel is whether you're obedient or disobedient, it's not a, that's not how you get in or get out, right? The gospel is what he's done on your behalf, and do you believe it? So you can make, these bad decisions Mm -hmm. and still have this weird relationship with God where in some way you still have faith, but you're going to pay the consequences of those decisions because they're real decisions based in reality Mm -hmm. and they affect real people. Right. Right. And so when you're saying like she knows this or that or the other, I think we look for spirituality as an escape goat to get us to a place of justification one way or another. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's not going to let her, he's going to put Jesus, the real God in front of her and, and basically say, in light of who this is and what mm-hmm. he's done, what do you think you should do? Because you're in trouble either way you go. Right. <laughs> well, let me read this real quick from Cape in the talk. Um, from what you said earlier, yeah. uh, this is about, you know, the, just these decisions and everything. He said, Because if we believe the gospel, adultery can't condemn us. And just as important, not committing adultery can't save us. What saves us is the free forgiveness of Jesus, not our works, not even our good works. How do you feel about that, brother? (laughs) Yeah. You know, when you first read it, I'm just like, yeah, that's that's true. You know, I know that to be true. But on a practical sense... It's a, it's kind of a gut checker because, you know, there's a lot of good stuff that I do. And, you know, I want to think that that has some good benefit to it. Um, there's also a lot of bad stuff that I do that I, I want to say, well, God covered it by grace. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so there's this. Yeah. I mean, thank you for being honest. Yeah. Well, there's just this tiltering of, you know, I think there's this natural thing in ourselves to think, man, what I do is good is somehow bringing me closer to God. But anything that I do that is bad, he's already he's already covered it, so I'm okay there. You know, we, there's not a, you know what I mean? There's kind of an unevenness to it is that anything good is a reward to me. Anything bad, well, I don't have to worry about that because I was already taken care of. So what are you saying? 
Well, what I'm saying is that I, I agree with what, what Capen is saying is that committing adultery in of itself is not going to condemn you from who God is and, and what he's done and what he's done. Exactly. And what, and not committing adultery is not going to make you any closer to him. He's already there. And so I think there's a good lesson here. I think this, you don't need to be, this isn't about counseling, by the way. Right. This is about being a good gospel. I call it gospel listener. Mm -hmm. When we're at a table, you know, we're part of a group, Lark Collective used to be the table network. Me and you right now are sitting around a table, mm-hmm. but we've met people around the table here. We've met around the table in coffee shops, wherever. And we, we get in these conversations. And being a good gospel listener is more than just um, looking for your moment to pounce on somebody intellectually with Jesus. Mm-hmm. It's this idea of hearing what they're going through and asking the question, what is good news to them? You know what I'm saying? What is it that they need to hear? And maybe this girl, maybe this lady who's committing this act did so out of a set of self-esteem issues or whatever issues she had going on in her whole life. Obviously, she had no understanding of who God really is. And therefore, if you don't, how can you really have a, an idea of who you are and what to do with your life? And I think these are all directly connected. And those also gives us an opportunity to show where good news goes when it comes to people. In other words, to interject something uh, about God and that's good towards them. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You know, uh, he, he's not looking for us to be cleaned up to clean us up. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's that, that, whole, that whole scripture where um, Jesus talks about... Uh, uh, oh crap! I'm, I'm. Uh, what was that? <laughs> Somebody look in. Of course. Um, I just lost my train of thought. What's that scripture where, uh, where we where G? I'm just blanking on the scripture right now. That threw me off. But um, the whole scripture where where Jesus says it's uh, you know, he's not looking for us to to not be sinners before he he heals us or heals us of that sin. It's this idea that be, because of who he is, he did what he is. Mm-hmm. I mean, what he does on our behalf, and he invites us to that thing. And so, being a good gospel listener is always is always appropriate uh, to be able to bring the good news in these situations. And I think we overlook that because we want to interject information, uh, good advice, and not just good news. Mm -hmm. So that's where I I get, I think I see to some degree, because I've been in some conversations myself, more outside the church than in. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, do you think that she doesn't know what's right or wrong here? Well, Capen even tells her that, you know, he's like, (laughs) if you're, you know... If you're asking me if adultery is wrong, you already know the answer to that. Like, I don't need to tell you that it's bad. <laughs> yeah. But he does warn us against oaths, and he, oaths and, and, but he, he also says, like, we have the assurance of that hope in him, mm-hmm. and that's to all people. And so the question is, in light of that, what will we do? What, what should we do? Mm-hmm. And... Why do you think that people would oppose his position here? Well, I know when I first, you know, so I read this maybe a month ago, the first time, just kind of reading through, not getting real deep in it. But I know the first time I read it, of course, my first initial reaction is, what? why aren't you telling her that it's bad and that she needs to stop? Like, she's harming people. She's doing uh-huh. all this stuff. And, and it can't be even says it at one point, like, I... I don't know the whole story here. And I think that's where like our morality alarms go off in our head and we want to pounce on that and just get the morality part of it out. And so as you've, you know, you've kind of said, and I've heard other people say before is that we want to change people into non sinners instead of Mm. proclaiming that Jesus and who he is, is actually powerful enough in and of itself you know, was it the Romans one sixteen that real, you know, real famous passage of, you know, the gospel of Jesus is power and salvation to those who believe. And do we actually believe that that gospel is power 
or do we want to first clean them up and make you know make all of them you know real nice you know clean lines and morality speak or do we want to say hey god's actually wants to be a part of that mess and the good news is he actually already knows what's going on and all he wants you to do is to invite him into it hmm. that's pretty good brother and and i think because we've made our religion as Christianity into sort of moralism, yeah, we we really intersect behavior with belief. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And you can't possibly be a believer. It, I'll never forget one of the first times I ever got pissed at church. I can't see that. <laughs> and, and here's what happened. And I don't know if this a pastor I still know today, and he's a good guy, but he really screwed this up. And it was a girl who was 15 years old, mm-hmm. who he had been counseling, and she ends up getting pregnant by her boyfriend, mm-hmm. who's 16 years old. They still come to church. They still, uh, you know, I like kept coming every Sunday to hear him speak. And he stood her up and made an example out of her in front of all the church and all the kids of what not to do with your life. And I, I'd never been, can you imagine being her that day, standing up and go, this girl said she's sorry for what she's done, but she got pregnant and sinned against God and all of us. And can you imagine what he did? And and, and in, in his mind, he thought he was saving the rest of the kids. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem with. Our religion is we think we're saving people. We think we're fixing situations or people or uh, this adulterous situation. Like we're, we're, we think we're doing that and that's our job. And it's not. That is not the job. Jesus did not call us to um, make sinners non sinners. Isn't that what you just said? Yeah. He didn't call us to do that. And we think that's literally what we do. So we spend. A lot of our time comparing our morals with their morals Mm -hmm. or our belief system to their belief system rather than proclaiming them something or offering something as an alternative that is good, like the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I think that, do you think that's where he's coming from? Because that's what I see in this conversation. Yeah, I I would definitely agree with that. That that is his primary objective is that because of the way she's presented the situation the thing that ticks off in his mind is not oh my she's committed this this horrible thing it's oh my she's got this horrible idea of who god is and that's just going to you know just pervade and infect all of her life and it is right Mm -hmm. it is and so can you see like what i see like I began to realize in having multiple conversations with a lot of different kind of people outside church walls that this thing that she's doing is a lot uh, is a lot of people. It's it's what a lot of people do. They think God is transactional. They think it's about morality or a morality. You know, have you ever heard this one? I you know I don't I can't live up I can't live up to that. I'm doomed. I'm doomed. You know, I just accepted that I'm doomed. Mm. And I think there's I think. When I was a immature 16-year-old, you know, you, you thought, well, if I send one time, I'm doomed. Right. Because that was my transactional understanding of God. So I might as well sin as much as I can because I'm already doomed. And I might as well just take it to the umph degree. Mm-hmm. And um, to hell with the consequences because I'm already going to hell. Right. You know what I mean? You're just thinking, uh, and you don't really believe it, but that's how you were taught. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of teens, a lot of immature people out there. They think that this is what the gospel is. It's it's a being in or out, or um, the the gospel is uh, a, a judgment, you know, on on their actions. And to a degree, it is. I mean, like it's a judgment on the sinful nature of man. Sure, but it's it's an offer of of good news, of grace, right? Mm -hmm. I I don't know. This is the mystery of Christ. Yeah. Well, and that's, 
getting back to, you know, where it is before is that we think our job is to somehow, you know, clean them up before God, where our first and primary objective is to help them see this amazing, wonderful God to us revealed in the scriptures and just trust the Holy Spirit to work on them. Right. And to transform. We, we, we have this idea that we have to intercede on God's behalf to make the transformation instead of getting to sit back and letting Jesus and the Holy Spirit just run the whole show. And we get to just partake in the wonderful experience of being friends with that person. And, and the scripture I was thinking of is Romans 5.8. Do you know what that one is? Uh, the why were you yet sinners? Yeah, okay. that's the one I was thinking of when I lost track of my thought. But but you see, like, it's while we were sinning. It wasn't like we got cleaned up. Everything's good now. Right. I'm never going to sin again. I mean, it, the funniest scripture in the Bible to me is the adulterous woman. Mm. When he's like, go sin no more. It's like, how the heck do we do that? Right. You know what I mean? It's like. We are sinners. We are going to be sinners. We're always going to be sinners until we come into the fullness of Christ at the end of days or whatever that is. And, But we've had the power to overcome those things that hinder our relationship with him and therefore mm-hmm. should result in some better decisions in our life because the most important thing in our life is that relationship with God. Right. You know what I mean? Like, And I think this is a relational thing, right? Yeah. Like, I don't know what her relationship is here with God. I think that's the point. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I will know, like, if I can just, you know, speak a little personally on this, it, that in my, you know, the earlier years of being a Christian now, I've only been a Christian for, you know, well, it's going on 11 years now, so still very young in my faith. But in the earliest years, you know, it, it was more focused on getting my act together and trying and striving really hard to be quote unquote, you know, a, a better person or whatever, you know, or whatever that, you know, means or, you know, but what I have found is that over time, that if I, you know, fix my gaze, you know, to use a popular speak on Jesus and what he's done, and just invite the Holy Spirit into my life and allow him to work on me, then it's not about me becoming a better person. It's actually what I think the Bible is getting at is me becoming a more, you know, full human. That right. From like original creation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, you know, sin and its destru- destructive power has, you know, just marred us and made us, you know, like C.S. Lewis says in The Great Divorce has made us like a ghostly figure. And that when we take our eyes off ourselves and on Christ and allow him to work on us, we become more and more solidified. I love that. And I think, you know, a lot of us are trying to get to heaven, maintain that idea of getting to heaven. I want to get to heaven, live that eternal life. Glory, glory. And then we read the Bible and it's really about heaven coming to us. Yeah. Well, you know, you know my thoughts on that. No, I want to hear them. (laughs) Well, yeah. So, you know, when it comes to, you know, this idea of getting to heaven, uh, we... Ha, you know, have this concept that we're only here for a temporary amount of time, and that if we do the certain things, you know, trust the certain ways or whatever, that our reward will actually be going to this other world called heaven. Now, of course, the Bible does talk about the paradise that Jesus says to the thief on the cross. There are definitely a few verses that you know we need to wrestle with and understand what is he talking about. But if heaven is anything, it's at least a temporary, you know holding space that if you look at Revelation 21 and 22, it's about a renewed heaven and earth, not a destruction of earth and us floating away to heaven. It's actually the full consummation of heaven, which is just where God is, God's space, coming down on earth and fully dwelling with his people, which is what the original intention was in Genesis 1 anyways. That is what the Garden of Eden is. And so it's just going back to his original intention. Okay, so when you read the Lord's Prayer, what do you hear? Yeah, so with the Lord's Prayer, what it, you know, this has actually been very helpful with, you know, N.T. Wright is that when you say, Our Father who art in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What you're actually saying in that prayer is that, God, I want to be a part of you that is helping heaven come down to earth. Right. And and why this is important, and I think I'm getting at, tell me if I'm getting at what you're getting okay. at, 
is it's, the gospel is not potential good news. Right. It's good news now. Yeah. It's good news for you and I now. Yeah, yeah. And so that's that's really important, too, because if you read, like, in the Gospel of John, he talks a lot about eternal life. And what we read in that is that heaven, that this is the temporary life now, the eternal life is heaven and someplace we go. But if you actually look at the Greek, a better translation of it is, is life in the age to come, which is what Jesus inaugurated by being incarnated right, on earth, right. is that we are in the age to come. It is here, or as theologians say, here and not yet. Like it is fully coming in its completeness. Right. But we are in that period now. And so that's where Jesus gets into this whole idea of live. You know, I've came that you may have life and life to the full. That, that, that starts today. And that starts by us trusting in him and what he's done for us. See, and this is why you're on that podcast right now. This is why, because that's good news, because this is the heart of this. She doesn't know this. She right. doesn't know the good news now. She doesn't right. know the Jesus who wants to give her that abundant love now, that mm-hmm. wants to give her that full life now. Right. And so she's still seeking uh, this transactional God that, well, to be honest, I don't believe in that God. You don't believe in that God. So I'm as atheist as she is on that God. You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't believe in that God. But she's still living as if that God is the God. And mm-hmm. so she's wheeling and dealing. It's transactional here. So why not make a transaction? Right. And that's a booby trap to a God who wants to be in your life now to give you purpose right. and meaning and significance now to give you fullness now to give you joy now. And I yeah. think, don't you think that's what he's sort of getting at or? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and I, and I don't want, you know, people to hear, you know, this, that, you know, he didn't come, you know, like, so when she's making these vows and everything and, you know, Capen says, well, you already know what you're going to do. I'm not here to tell you yes or no. I, I, you know, tell me if I'm wrong. I don't hear Capen, you know, condoning her to keep in adultery. No. What I, what I hear Capen saying is, look, Christ has given you the freedom and you are going to make those decisions, whether good or bad. My job is not to put a prison cell around you and keep you high and tight to some morality of what I seek to be better my job is to proclaim that what Christ has already done and to take your eyes off of yourself and put your eyes on him and then let him transform you because that is what true freedom is. Yeah, and he says, and because remember now we're, we're, we're in the second chapter where he's right. telling us his thoughts on this. And this, can I read what he says sure. about this? He says, her God, I told her, is not the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ whom I, whom I am commissioned to represent and whom she as a Christian supposedly trusts. She spent a good bit of time, of course, trying to ace me to, into admitting that her God was the true one and that mine was the product of an ab- ab- aberrant and excessively easygoing state of mind, but I never gave an inch. And I refuse to do so because I'm convinced that while people are indeed able to hear the good news and hear it gladly because it's obviously the sweetest deal they're ever going to be offered, They can't listen to it for long without pulling the wet blanket of their fear-mongering theology down over their heads. They're actually more rattled by the liberating, guilt-abolishing news of grace than they are by the fears and the choices that they've made. Wow. I agree with that 100%. Now, as a young Christian... I would have been like, I don't know, man. Like we're, you know, it's it's about the law. You gotta, right. and and he 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 he's giving her grace no matter what she decides. Mm-hmm. Now that is a tough one for religious folk to drink, yeah, or to eat, yeah, like you, Chris. <laughs> are, you, are, you gonna, are you ready? Are you willing to eat that? Well, and, and, and I'm glad you brought up, you know, got you know brought up the law because. You know, if you look at Romans, you know, Paul doesn't back down from that. He says that, yeah, the law is, you know, in itself is good. But actually what Christ, when Christ came, it wasn't to nullify, to abolish or get rid of. It's actually this whole law thing is just being fully enacted in him. It's being fulfilled. Like Jesus is the whole representation of what the law was trying to do. And he's just fulfilling that emptiness of it. Okay. And what do you th- what are you saying about her then? 
what I'm saying about her is that, you know, if her focus is on, you know, if we're going to go back to this idea of the law, that I guess maybe ask your question a different way. Okay. Sorry. Ask it a different way. Sure. Um, all right. Let's let's let's. Why do you think she's fearful? Why let's let's mm-hmm. let's go this route, which I think is still asking the same question. Oh, sure, but sure. Let, let's get the Chris side of you here. Yeah. The um. Why would she be coming to the pastor with this? Why is she fearful? Mm. I mean, what would cause that? <clears throat> yeah, I think that she she feels that, that if she doesn't make the quote-unquote right decision, that it's going to somehow, like you said, put her into, to quote Cape in Dutch with God. <laughs> right. He loves that phrase. He Dutch. uses a ton of the Bible that's, that's, in the book. Um, but yeah, he... Yeah, it's a better she's, phrase than I would probably come up with. Yeah, that yeah, she's afraid that if she doesn't make the right decision, that you know she's going to suffer the eternal consequences of that. Right, and I think don't you think? Now here's where it's going to get a little different between you and me, because mm-hmm. I keep burping. I don't know why, but people go to their pastors because they look. Not only for spiritual guidance, I do I do think there's legitimate spiritual guidance there, but most of the time, not so much. There's legitimate where it happens sometimes. But most of the time, they really want the church to be their daddy. Mm-hmm. They really want that pastor to give to be that daddy figure. And that is the most horrifying and terrible idea ever in my mind. How do you feel about that? So when you elaborate more on what you mean by daddy. We, they, to, we want our pastors to have all the answers like we think our dads have them. We want them mm-hmm. to comfort and love us when we make these bad, bad, horrible decisions and make it all go away and fix it all and and to be this parental figure. And, and see, what I really think church should be is a community of people that are are really – bonding as friends and have a common mission in heart Mm -hmm. and we 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 take we've taken it into this whole other thing like well this these people are going to help raise my kids or Mm, yeah you know help disciple my bad decisions even though we don't really want we think all this kind of stuff but we really don't want somebody over our neck like going why did you watch that movie or Mm -hmm. You know all that kind of stuff, and and I and and because of it, we ultimately end up back in law, and back in anxiety, and back in fear because it becomes more about obedience. There's this discussion we had prior to this. It becomes more about obedience and pleasing Daddy than it does about our relationship with God by grace and freedom. Mm-hmm. Boom. <laughs> what do you think about that? He, he gets into the role of not only the pastor, but the church here. Right, right. You want me to read what he, or you want to make a comment? No, go ahead. I'll read you what he said. And he said, speaking of, for a fear, I want to go back to the moment, to the word daddy I introduced a few paragraphs earlier. The church more often than not has gleefully thrown itself in the role of being everybody's mommy and daddy. The whole exercise is a terrible idea. The insidious parental image of a church doesn't that a church doesn't conform to what even halfway a halfway decent parent actually does. Only rotten fathers and mothers rid roughshod over their children's freedom to make mistakes. Only the worst parents ever suggest that there are unforgivable acts that will, unless avoided by children, be the death of parental love. Only the most dreadful grown-ups use fear to control the young. That there are a good number of disreputable types and that all of us to some degree are equally disreputable should not blind us to the fact that the concept of God as an angry, unforgiving parent and of his church as a domineering grown-up issuing threats to willful kids is bad news, not gospel. <laughs> you get you get that? Do you how you feel about that? I'm looking at you and you're like, oh 
that, is that hard to take? That's a yeah. That's a that's a hard one. Yeah, because I think we we place such a, a high emphasis in the leadership of our church that there's some you know that they almost are be, you know almost come as standing on God's behalf like a Moses figure. Okay. And and they're the you know and so when we're looking to them to you know like I said guide us in all these different areas. What is the what is the church most afraid of? Control? No, that's the one thing they're into. <laughs> or being right? out of control then? <laughs> like like I grew up you see, I don't know how you grew up in church. Right. I can tell you how I grew up in church. And I know anybody that's grown up, grown, grown up through the 80s mm-hmm. will understand exactly what I'm... We were not allowed to listen to... to Striper, for God's sakes, was evil rock and roll. The, the, to hell with the devil. To guys. hell with... The, they're singing to hell with the devil, and that was still <laughs> Satan's music because they had voodoo drum beats. You get what I'm saying? Let alone... Bon Jovi or Billy Idol or or uh, Dokken or you know Motley Crue or for God's sake you know what I mean these were all evil satanic all this kind of crap and we started taking on these issues oh, okay right becoming mommy and daddy out of fear mm-hmm. but fear of what that's what I want to ask you because you're from the younger generation right yeah. Uh, why do you think the, the church? What? Why do you think the church is fearful and takes on this role willingly of mommy and daddy? I guess to the fear that they're going to leave to go into the world. I yeah, to agree. I, I would say freedom. Hmm. The gospel. We talked about this earlier. The gospel offers freedom, and you can't control freedom, mm-hmm. right? We're we're seeing this in this country right now. Mandates everywhere. All this, not to get into the political side of mm-hmm. things, but all these things that we should or should not do that are being forced upon us through the autocracy of rather social media or corporate autocracy, uh, all this kind of stuff that's being forced upon us, mandated upon us, and, and groupthink and all these different things. And what are they afraid of? Freedom, free thinking, that we might make a mistake. And guess what? We're going to. Right. You know what I mean? Like, we, what people don't know, I mean, this same guy that's proclaiming grace here made a mistake. Yeah. He was booted out of the church. Mm-hmm. And I find his writings to be one of the most powerful writings I've ever come across, and I've read a lot. I think you can be a witness that we are readers. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no question about it. And so I do think that it's dangerous uh, – Telling kids to be fearful of that, and if you do this, then we're not going to love you anymore. You're going to be outside of our group. Yeah. That's like a Muslim kind of thing. We don't think we're like that, but we, we are, unless they come back. Mm. You know what I mean? And what he's saying here, notice, is like, I'm not going to make your decision for you, right. but I'll be there with you every step of the way. And he knew her husband. Mm-hmm. Think about how hard that would be. Yeah, yeah. And he could play the role like, hey, you know. Guess what I just heard? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like he could play all that role, but instead he chose to offer grace where sin abound. Right. And I think there's something in the Bible about where <laughs> sin abound, grace abounds <laughs> that abound, much yeah. more. Yeah. But I think he comes down on the church here. What what do you think about that? That well, I understand. I guess maybe I'm not under Standing what I think on that, like I do agree with what he's talking about. That, yeah, the church can't be that authoritarian parental ruler, and I think he even talks about that. That if they do, what could end up happening is just this complete rebellion of the children because they're like, I got to get free of this, you know, domineering oversight, or. You know, sometimes worse than we see in the prodigal son story that they, you know, they become so, you know, straight laced that they don't even realize what's going on. So I have a ton of people that have come through our ministry and you've met some of Mm -hmm. them. And what if the Catholic Church would have been the counselor? here? What would that, what their response be to adultery? Oh. What would your church, what would be their response 
to that adultery. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what he's getting at. Yeah. Ultimately, at the end of it is like, yeah. what are we spending our time doing mm -hmm. as opposed to proclaiming? Right. And, you know, like many, there's many people that have had rough, made bad decisions when they're young, got married young, right. got divorced young, kicked out of the Catholic Church, get kicked out of this church, get um, uh, banished for one reason or the other in this other church. And he says this is why church needs to perpetually get its grip back on the gospel, the good news of grace and forgiveness, and to protest in every age against theological models that will blow the gospel out of the water. Indeed, that is the reason why I'm writing this book, to protest against just such a model, a model I call transactionalism, mm -hmm. and to witness to a better model based on the mystery of Christ. Because while it is indeed quite sufficient for all purposes, here or hereafter, to say you trust Jesus as your Savior, to affirm as the ultimate concern in your life a relationship of faith with him as a person, almost nobody is able to let it just go at that. That's powerful, dude. That is completely powerful. We want to theologize. Mm -hmm. We want a moral high ground. Mm -hmm. We want to map measure and manage people's lives. Right. And I think this has been sort of my complaint. It's I wrote a book about it. Mm -hmm. Is what does that say to the world? Right. You know what I'm saying? I mean, do you see this or is it just Robert and me? <laughs> no, I definitely do see, especially on Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> or TikTok, yeah. The yeah, any social media platform movement. of your choosing, yeah, <laughs> you'll definitely see it there. Um, but yeah, I'm sure I've seen it, you know, even in people in my own church, absolutely. And just the other churches I've been a part of in the past. So as we come to the conclusion, what do you think his point is of these? So so what what should be the point of this chapter? What should be the message that we're trying to get across as we're talking to our audience here? You, Chris, in your first <laughs> podcast. Second no pressure podcast, here. If you get it wrong, everybody Second will go podcast, to hell. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, the, the title of the second chapter is The Mystery and Guilt. And what he's, I think, trying to get at is that, you know, we can't, in our guilt, try to clean ourselves up better before God. We have to accept really the piece of junk that we are and realize that that's actually the person Jesus wants us to be is that piece of junk. Because that's who he died for. And so the point of the chapter, I would say, is get your eyes off of yourself and onto God and just accept and believe, which is trust, it's loyalty, it's all these things that what he's done is for you and it's already done. It's, it's a historical event. The crucifixion, the death, the resurrection, the life of Jesus is an historical event. It's already happened. It's not something waiting to happen on your beck and call. Yeah. It's just a matter of this is the most amazing news ever. Are you going to believe it? Are you going to trust it? Are you going to rest in it? And are you going to walk in it? I love that. And... You know, we were talking a little bit beforehand here, and I, I do like something that we talked about, which was if Jesus walked in the room. Right. You know, like, I know it's, I mean, it's a sort of a fantasy, like, could this happen? But if Jesus walked in the room, what would be our response? Would we, would we stand up and go like, here, here, Lord, this is what I've done. Mm -hmm. And I just want you to know, you're the, you're amazing, Lord. This is why I did it. I gave up all this and I did this. Or would we immediately fall to our faces and realize what he's done? Yeah. And I think when that's a really powerful imagery, if we're honest, mm -hmm. if we're honest. I think there was a time in my life where I would have said, no fruit, no loot. Right. Until I realized, like, I don't make fruit. It's God who does fruit. Yeah. He's, he's the vine dresser, you know. And go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, you're speaking of, you know, John 15, you know, abide in me and I abide in you. You're the vine. I mean, you're the branch. I'm the true vine. And I was just listening on another podcast and the guy made, a, I think, a really good comment is where does the vine end and where does the branch begin? You know, there doesn't seem, you know, it's kind of hard to find that distinction sometimes that when we are bearing. Well, I think fruit, a vine does, doesn't think it's the, the entirety of it all. Or what do you, I mean, do you have an answer for that? 
No, not off the top of my head. I, I think there's a oneness in Christ, but you know, you know that you're not the vine dresser. Oh. No. no, the father's <laughs> clearly the vine dresser. The, yeah, you know what I mean? You, you know that. But I think in our posture, and in this case, you know, as we go through this, you know, like our posture to the world can be like we have all the answers, that mm-hmm. we're doing everything perfect, and um, our behavior is is the witness to our belief instead of the proclamation. Right. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to... I'm going to fail Chris. Mm-hmm. Like, I love Chris. Chris is my friend. I love having conversations and such with Chris. But at some point, I'm going to fail Chris. I'm going to fail people. Mm-hmm. And do I get the same grace that God has given Chris in our relationship together? And in, and, and if I don't, if I have a legalistic perspective on that, then I'm going to be searching for answers in our relationship and... Uh, being taking a high or low position, to, probably dependent on my uh, uh, insecurities, rather than being more secure in our mutual belief that, well, this guy, he understands good news. I understand good news. Mm-hmm. I just have to ask for forgiveness in our relationship. And when it comes to Helen in this mm-hmm. chapter, she doesn't even think about any of that. Mm-hmm. Because her God is transactional. It's not based in the mystery of Christ. We don't know why God, why does the God of the universe, who's holy, obviously, right, step into the most unholiest place and offer his love? Mm-hmm. Who can understand that? That's a mystery in itself. Right. But that is the God who gets his hands dirty, who, mm-hmm. who puts his feet to the ground, man. Right. And and says there's no condemnation in those that are in me. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. And we're out there trying to moralize with the cancel culture. <laughs> yeah. And I think our natural response, it's always lopsided, I found, is that when we read, you know, Romans 8 for their... Are, is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. And we hear that and we think of ourselves and we're like, man, that's so true. But we kind of refuse to let that be true over other people's lives. Oh, absolutely. We will, over our own lives, grace abounds abundantly. Right. <laughs> you know what, I mean? what, what, what have you said before that, you know, we always, you know, is that we always want grace for ourselves, but not for the other person? Yeah, I'm that way. I can get mad. You know, and I think about in my own life, you know, I, that's the great thing, you know, after this, you know, these couple of chapters, you know, Cape and I kind of dug in the last 11 years of, you know, being a Christian. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but So wait, uh, you're, you're telling me like after reading this, you started rethinking of like. I'm just like going through. My, you know, your own personal. Little, well, I'm just thinking through this idea of grace that, you know, there, there are, I, I know where I'm at today. And I know where I was 11 years ago. And God has walked through just my stupidity, my muck, my insolence, just everything. And it has just been by his grace that the Holy Spirit, and a lot of times I didn't even know it was there, but was actually walking with me every step of the way for that, the last 11 years. Mm. And I don't know where I'm going to be 20, 30 years from now. But what I have found is that my natural tendency is I see where I'm at today. And I want to fast forward people's lives that took me 11 years to get to where I'm at today. Yeah. And I want to shorten it to 11 days. How much, this is something I think he hits on in this chapter that we haven't talked too much about. But how much of our relationship is based off our theology and how, with God? Mm-hmm. Which means how much of our relationship with God and others is based off our theology? Oh, absolutely. And how much is based off of our relationship? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, I would you get say, what I'm saying. Right. Like, there's well, those are two completely different things. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think um, you just, you know, I, I've taken a lot of philosophy classes and stuff, and that there's a lot that shows that what you believe, and so theology is what we believe about God, will directly influence our actions. And so, if you believe that, you know, God is you know, the the man in the sky who's controlling everything distant and never wants to be a part of it, but is one, you know, but is maniacally controlling that that's going to influence not only your belief that you have toward him, but your belief that you have toward others. Yes, absolutely. 
And I think it's a we have to have some we we only can believe what has been revealed. But I often wonder when I'm seeing Jesus when Jesus talks to the adulterous woman, mm-hmm. when he talks to the Samaritan woman, to Zacchaeus, mm-hmm. to the tax collector, to the Pharisee. Right. What theology is he holding that is is preventing their entrance into his kingdom mm. or keeping him from those people mm-hmm. because of A, B, or C. Yeah. And I don't see that theology. Right. I don't, yet we've created, and that's in, I mean, when we talk about holiness, he is holiness. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't get any holier than God. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And yet I hear people like, I'm not going to celebrate Halloween mm. because. You know, you know, it's Satan's holiday and I don't want to get my hands dirty and mm-hmm. whatever stupid ass reason they come up with. Right. And it's dumb when you really get down because there's nothing good being offered right. on an alternative to get to know those people mm-hmm. that are in your neighborhood or not to bring in that all, all that into the Halloween. But it's a great example of of theology getting in the way of relationship. And I think it's like um, it's very limiting to mm-hmm. the potential of our faith, right? Right. Because do you do you agree with that? I mean, that's that's a tough one, but I really do sort of believe that. I'm not saying go sin. That's not what I'm saying. Right. But I'm saying like, what limits our faith as opposed to our theology? Yeah, and, and I'm thinking, you know, in John 17, which is one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible. The, that, the prayer? Yeah, yeah, that it has just always astonished me that God, the second person of the Trinity, would pray for us. It just is absolutely astonished. Like, we should be praying to him, and he's the one praying for us. And what does he pray? Not that, God, you would take them away from this world, but, God, that you would protect them. Mm. And so I'm thinking, like, back to your example of the Halloween, that if we take... Now, it's really... And just a, a real quick history... There was this group of people in the first century in Jesus' time called the Essenes yeah. that basically believed that Jerusalem was so corrupt that they had to get out of Dodge and set up camp in the desert, and that's the only way God's going to come. And I feel like a lot of us want to take that position, which is this holiday that's called Halloween has been so corrupted in so many different ways that our only reaction we can, we can do to it is to get out of Dodge and stay away from it. But what we can find, though, is that we don't have to quote unquote participate in or condone or anything in it we can just be a light in it and i love what you did a couple years ago where you had that um cooler that said adult beverages Mm -hmm. and it you know and i found like you know there's probably 50 percent of the people you know there's a couple people that are like oh cool i'll just reach in and grab it like it's no big deal And there's a couple people that were completely taken away but it, it, it wasn't you know, meant to like, oh, I, I condone any, you know, horrible thing. It's to say, no, here, here's this traditional event that we want to run away from. But Jesus has prayed a protection over us and we get to just sit in and love people through it. Absolutely. And and so to end this, this is how Capon ends the, the chapter. He says, oh, I know this whole thing gives you problems. You're worried that it might give you people, it might give the people the idea that they have permission to sin. Because we're talking about freedom and grace, really. Right. Well, I have news for you. Everybody, to the best of my knowledge, already has permission to do any damn fool thing that the, he or she can get away with. That doesn't make it smart to sin, or even fun to sin, or even make sin a good idea because it gives grace a chance to abound. But it does mean that God, on the available evidence, is not serious, seriously in the sin prevention business. He is in the sin forgiving business. He says, I judge no one. I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world, John twelve forty seven. So no matter what we do, therefore, we are off the judgment hook as long as we are in life. And we are off, off it forever as well, I think. Because if you read the judgment passages in Scripture in in the light of the irrevocable grace that the New Testament, Testament posits as the heart of God's plan, you come up with a distinctly happier picture even of the last judgment. But that's the large subject. 
and it will certainly come up again. Since it's already a long chapter, let's move on. Yeah? I think that's a good place to stop. Is there anything you want to say on the on concluding that? I think that's what we're getting at. Yeah. I, Are I, we okay with grace? Yeah. I know, like, for me, when I first, you know, when I first read that, and, and to be honest, I'm still kind of wrestling through that paragraph. Is that <laughs> every part of me, you know, just perks up. Because when I hear the word permission... I hear condoning that you have the authority you have the you have essentially my stamp of approval to go out and do whatever you want and I know that's not what Capen's saying well th- that's why I was asking the question is our relationship through theology with God or is it in a relationship with God right. and in relationships like I'm in a marriage mm-hmm. and I have and this is going to shock you Chris but I have not always been perfect in that relationship. I've said things I that I shouldn't. To this. <laughs> I have said things I shouldn't. And you know what I mean? And you have to learn how to walk in that freedom. Right. You know what I mean? I've said things about other people mm-hmm. to Kim or to whatever, to, in our relationship that, you know, maybe wasn't the best thing ever to say. And you have to learn how to walk in that freedom. Right. But... She, at least, if we have this thing called grace in our relationship, we can come to forgiveness and humility and learn to love each other in those things right. in our mistakes. But if we exclude that completely and, and it's about A, B, and C, mm-hmm. well, sooner or later, A, B, and C sucks. Yeah. And it's hard to live up to. And you don't even want to live up to it. Right. You know what I mean? I want to listen to Striper, Chris. I want to listen to Striper. I love Striper. The first missional community ever in this mm-hmm. world. And the church turned on him. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, it's just, it's no wonder that, you know, throughout, you know, the New Testament, that over and over the analogy used of the relationship to church and Christ is a marriage, that we are the bride mm. of Christ. And if you look at, you know, if you read like Isaiah and Ezekiel, especially Ezekiel, it's, Israel, you have gone off and done these horrible things. You have just completely rejected who I am. And just over and over and over, God is using through the mouthpiece of Ezekiel, please come back to me. Yes. And what does he say? Because if you come back to me, I will forgive you. Mm. And I will make you the adorned holy bride that you are, which is called the church today. Ooh. Love it. And, And... and just to kind of end so how does uh, tie it up tie up the yeah chapter. yeah yeah you know so just to end on that is that we we have this epitomized understanding of what we think our job is as Christians is to be non sinners, but our job is to not be non sinners. Our job is to be more to gain a greater and greater trust of who Jesus is, mm. and just and in I that love trust it. believe. That he's going to work it out for us, and we got all eternity to hang out with him. That's right, and and we can take these into our conversations. All right, I know we've gone a little long on this one, but I think it's been a great talk, and I think it it gives us something to chew on. And as our listeners listen, we would love to hear back from you on these things. What are you wrestling with? What are you? What what are, is grace? The freedom of grace, something you wrestle with, or do you need? To put your hands on it, to touch it, to add to it. We'd love to hear. Oh, Siri's talking to me. No, but anyway, we would really love to hear from you. We want to thank you for listening to us. It was great to have somebody to talk about today. We're going to get off this until the next one. We want to thank everybody for listening. Go to www.inferentswap.com. Go to Podbean and subscribe and share this with your friends. If you want to be part of that uh, um Wow, what the heck is that? Premier, what the heck am I thinking about that? That Premier podcasting side of our stuff. Go ahead and subscribe to that too, and you'll get a lot of good content. Oh, on Podbean? Huh? On Podbean, on Podbean there's a Premier side. What is it? I'm blanking on what that is. But anyway, there's if you pay $9.99, you can uh, support the ministry mm-hmm. and also uh, get some great books that are back there and some great audio books that are back there that you'll love. I Trust me on this. All right, we're out of here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll catch you next week. Yeah, go bye. Peace, my friends.